for joining us. I am Srili Kapale, Fairfax GOP Vice Chair of Strategy and Engagement. Our goal through this program, Conversations That Count, is to bring in guests that can address challenges facing our communities, provide solutions, and inspire change. In honor of Black History Month, I am honored and excited to invite Ms. Mary Milburn. Mary is a singer who will make you love our country again. Her rousing arrangements of America's patriotic music and international anthems evoke emotional response and stir patriotism universally. She's a proud resident of Virginia. Mary has performed the national anthem and patriotic music for three consecutive US, US presidents internationally too, and she has performed um, in front of world leaders. She has been featured at the White House, the United States Congress. She was featured at the 2020 Republican National Convention, the 58th presidential inauguration victory celebration of President Trump for NFL, NBA, MLB, Ol Olympics, and in concert halls worldwide. She's devoted to using her voice and platform to share God's love to hearts and lands globally. In fact, she was at live from CPAC yesterday that she wanted to come to us, but she wasn't unable to due to conflict. She performed there last night for the annual Ronald Reagan dinner. Please welcome award-winning American singer and actress, Mary Melvin. Mary, please welcome. We, I'm honored that you're here. Hello, Shalika, my dear. It's great to see you, my sister, and hello to all of the audience. Uh, let me first apologize, Shalika. I'm so sorry about yesterday. We had we had this planned out for a, a while, uh, well before I knew I was going to be singing at CPAC. And so uh, please forgive me that we had to reschedule to this evening. I'm, but I'm so glad we were able to, to, to do this because I've been wanting to, to visit with you. And certainly hello to all the Fairfax County Republican Committee family, all of the state of Virginia family, and all of those certainly watching across the world. What a joy it is to be with you all this evening. And uh, thanks for having me, Shalika. No, thank you, Mary. Mary, let, let me ask you, you are unique in your own way. You're an artist, you're a performer, you're a celebrity. You are a former White House presidential appointee to jo President George W. Bush. And you're also, you also have sung, as I mentioned in my introduction. You're also trusted voice. That's one thing that I um, heard about you when you were doing your interviews, when I was listening to your interviews. You're not only a trusted voice in the United States and knows firsthand how to bridge commentary and politics, entertainment and culture, and you're a beloved voice in the global conservative movement. How did all this began? Oh, I, I, who is that person? Shalika, I don't know who that is. <laughs> I'm just a small town, you know, country girl from Oklahoma. So that's uh, that's certainly how I see myself. But uh, thanks for the nice introduction, dear. Uh, you know, I tell you, I, I always first credit God. I always first give glory to God because he, in him, we live and move and have our being. So uh, certainly to the audience watching, I, it's hard for me to answer questions without invoking or talking about faith or God because he's the, the root and source of my life. So I certainly don't mean to offend uh, anyone uh, in invoking that, but but that would be the first uh, answer to your question is, is the Lord really charted my steps very early uh, in high school and in college that certainly led me into a life in American politics. Politics, uh, and then later on into a career in entertainment. So I really uh, credit God for that. And then I, you know, certainly credit great mentors, great people, you know, my parents who certainly stimulated us to uh, follow the voice of God and certainly do those things that we were being felt called to do. Uh, and, uh, and really my, my service, my start really got my, my, I started, my, I guess the start of my career really uh, commenced in Washington, D.C. Uh, in my service for President Bush and, and former First Lady Laura Bush. And, and working as an appointee exposed me to Washington, D.C. It introduced me to my first job singing, in fact, certainly uh, singing at the White House and then uh, singing in theaters across Washington, D.C. that certainly led me to New York. And so D.C. is really a part of my origins, both in the context of being a public servant uh, and uh, being an entertainer. And so um, I really treasure those moments that I had in D.C. as a young staffer, uh, learning the policymaking process and certainly learning the ins and outs of Washington, D.C. But it really um, it really uh, impacted 
all that I'm doing now as an entertainer and what my platform really means. You know, Shirley, I love America. And uh, as I know you do too. And, uh, you know, and so it's been beautiful to be able to take some of that life from American politics and, and have it now in my career as an entertainer and share love of country across the world. That's a universal feeling. That's a universal Absolutely, feeling. Mary. So Mary, you're an outspoken conservative. I've heard a lot of your videos. What are the party values that you think resonated with you? And um, the second part of this question that I'm very curious, especially knowing your background, is it challenging to be a conservative in liberal media? How do you manage to balance your personal political views with your professional networks that yeah. by far have liberal views? How do you balance that? Well, you know, all the world's a stage as, uh, as they say, certainly in our world. And so you just learn how to be the best representative for God on every stage that you are put on. That's my philosophy. You know, I've lived a life, a bipartisan life. So I have friends on both sides of the aisle. I sing on both sides of the aisle. Uh, as a outspoken conservative, I've, I've been a lifelong Republican, that's no secret. And certainly a, a lifelong uh, active and vocal member of the conservative or American movement as we call it. And, you know, I just feel like that's, you have to have that philosophy. Be who God has called you to be on whatever stage that you're put on and whatever audience that you're put in front of. And, and nobody, can, nobody can argue with love of country. Nobody can argue with being proud to be an American. And I think that is what has stimulated certainly my career is, you know, Republicans, Democrats, vegan, whatever, you know, <laughs> I think at the end of the day, you, whatever your fancy may be, uh, we all love America and we all want the best for uh, each other as Americans. Absolutely. Patriot, I said patriotism, national anthem has no uh, race, color, creed, right. or party right. affiliation by any means. That's right. That's right. Uh, uh, Mary, your platform is also rooted in cultural diplomacy and you're regarded as cultural ambassador. That's how I came to know of you a few years back. And this is known across the world and as a relevant communicators towards expounding on international matters. I heard you speak about one of the farmers pro protests in, I believe in Canada or in India for that matter. Um, as a CEO of JMDE Enterprises, uh, you're a strong supporter of free market too and yes. the power of business partnership across borders. So what do you think of the current business climate in the United States? Do we still possess that free market spirit? Oh, absolutely. Free market, uh, freedom, period, is the brand of America. And so uh, when you go across the world and whatever you, your activities may be, you will see that America is always looked to as the beacon uh, for freedom, as the, as, the, as the model for freedom. And so the, the conversation of free market certainly is alive and well here. And, and it's in, it is desirable, certainly across the world. I, I, and my travel certainly in interfaces with international governments and heads of states and leaders. It's the top conversation on everybody agenda is how can we create societies that give more opportunity for everyday citizens to experience whether it's the American dream, the Indian dream, the, the African dream, whatever it may be. And so I think that, uh, again, just like love of country is a universal conversation, so is freedom. So is free, you know, free, freedom and, and, and market, freedom, freedom and enterprise. And, and kind of going back to your question before, why that attracted me to the Republican party specifically is because that's a staple of our party. The, the three, I think the hallmarks of our party certainly are faith, family, and freedom. Freedom being so most important. And so, um, yeah, I, I, regardless of what you see in the media and regardless of what's going on across the world, freedom is alive and free market is alive. And we, we all have to do our part in, in, um, in stimulating that in our, in our, in our, in our country, in our world. Mary, so very well said. I said, that's why I'm in America, right? I enjoyed the faith. I enjoyed the freedom. Yes. So there is no other better place than uh, being that's America, right. too, if you want to go for that. Uh, right. So Mary, just kind of knowing you a little more about your bio, what I said in the uh, beginning is just li literally well, not even one fourth of your, what you have done. You're such a young lady. You've done been part of multiple charities. You support the Human Exploitation Rescue Operation, Child Rescue Corps, which I think is extremely noble. You also do the mission of education in Africa, which is so very needed. Um, and can you talk to me more about the mission of these charities? How did you get involved in all these charities uh, and good ones? 
Well, and absolutely. And thank you for mentioning those. You know, my real heart, of course, I love to uh, certainly be involved in efforts that uh, are stimulating uh, policy that uh, supports all Americans. I certainly love being on stages performing that uses music as a way to foster unity and hope. Uh, but I tell you, my real love is, is my philanthropic work and supporting charities and organizations that are about the betterment of humanity. And so the ones that you mentioned, certainly speaking to human trafficking, which is something that's a big part of my, my platform and child exploitation. We're seeing such uh, horrific, horrific stories and the escalation of that across the world. Certainly during COVID really uh, changed the world. And in some ways it made it a, a more dangerous place in, in these kinds of conversations. And so uh, I, I have become even more aggressive and active on advocating for organizations and efforts to combat human trafficking. Uh, so Certainly, uh, that was a big part of the last four years of President Trump's administration and, and uh, with Ivanka leading that and a lot of those efforts there uh, with uh, child exploitation, human trafficking. Education Africa, which is really my heart, uh, a wonderful uh, nonprofit organization in South Africa started by the late President Nelson Mandela and the late Walter Susulu, uh, run by good friend James Irdong. And it does wonderful work uh, bringing education and an opportunity and program to some of the poorest areas in South Africa, now scaling across the continent of Africa. And so anything that has to do with our children, anything that has to do with education, uh, that's my heart, because I think at the end of the day, whatever we're doing, we need to be fostering the next generation and bringing Absolutely. Yeah. Mary, you're, you're just such an amazing person in and out. And so this is actually the right, I think this question is, a, I'm asking to the right person. Patriotism, obviously, as I can see, it's in your blood. However, many today contracts that with the nationalism. How do you navigate the line? Because I've been told when I say I'm patriotic, and I've always been that way. When I was in India, I was extremely sure. patriotic. I came here, I'm a but how do you navigate that line between patriotism and nationalism? Not that I'm saying nationalism is wrong, but a lot of people kind of redefine nationalism as being extreme. What do you think mainstream media is benefiting by encouraging that kind of divisive rhetoric about uh, nationalism being an extreme, uh, extreme value? How do you navigate that? Well, you know, God bless the, the media, you know. <laughs> I have lots of friends in the media, so let me just preface by saying, you know, Media and, and freedom of speech and all that is very important. So I, I'm not I'm not criticizing media in totality, but I feel there are, are pieces of our, our media, certainly in America, that are misguided and have the wrong definition of nationalism. So I think that's one problem. But I, I don't see a, a, a problem with being patriotic and certainly having threads of nationalism. I think they really are twins. They go hand in hand. And, and like we talked about earlier, love of country is a universal conversation. You can go anywhere in the world and, and the love of, of your country's flag and the love of your country's anthem and patriotic music and, and the love of being a citizen uh, of, your, of your heritage, that is, that is something that is embedded in all of us. And I certainly have been grateful to have a platform that allows me to sing anthems across the world and experience patriotism and nationalism at the same time in, in beautiful people. And so we're being, we're in a time, uh, Sherlika, in the country where we're being taught that um, America is not a good country or our kids are being taught these things that are not true. America is the greatest country in the world. America, I'll say it again, is the greatest country in the world. And, and everybody across the world is eager to get here, whether it's to start a business or bring their family here or find opportunity and hope. And so I, I, I encourage uh, us as Americans to keep fostering that, that conversation in our kids and certainly keep fostering the energy of love of country and patriotism across the world. While we are Americans, we're also world citizens, global citizens, and we should in every way we can foster that energy and humanity, absolutely. Mary, is this, I mean, uh, you are obviously in the uh, media much more than I ever have been. So is this because we are close to politics, we are close to media, we are close to Washington, D.C., we feel this mainstream divisive rhetoric, or is this going on across the world and across the, the rural parts of the country? I know you said you're a small part, uh, small town girl. So uh, I, I always wonder, is it because I live in and around the Beltway, or is this 
politics this divisive everywhere in the world? Honestly, I, I, I see this, this energy of, of a movement of truth, as I would call it. My good friend Glenn, Black, Glenn Beck, who spoke at the Ronald Reagan dinner uh, at CPAC here recently. And by the way, CPAC was such an incredible time this year. Uh, but I think that you're seeing this, this movement of truth happening across the world. This, this desire for us to reclaim freedom, reclaim what is ours as citizens, but what we all should reclaim as as, as humanity, what we're seeing in Canada, what you're seeing over in, in, uh, in parts of South America and in Africa, what you're seeing across Asia, it's a, it's a global conversation of, of, uh, of freedom and a global conversation about what is best for humanity. And so I, I, while we certainly are seeing those things magnified in the United States, I think it's a universal conversation and it's exciting because I, I'm seeing uh, persons who perhaps not traditionally get involved in public dialogue or policy awakening and speaking. Mom, for example, moms and parents all over the country and certainly across the world who are getting up and speaking, uh, certainly for the rights of their home and their children, but what they want and what's best for their, the education of their children. A conversation of freedom, what you're seeing with the truckers in Canada, and God bless all those truckers and their families who were speaking against uh, the, the, the overreach of government, certainly that's what it is, and unifying around that message of freedom. You're seeing it all over the world, Shalika, and I think that movement of truth is, is not, uh, not going to die. In fact, it's just started. To be well, it's so uh, it's a kind of like reassurance for me as a mom to think that somebody yeah. that's not within the school board meeting supervisor meeting feels that we really need to stand up and uh, yes. fight for it. And I think you said said it very well when you're talking about truckers' movements. You're not talking about mass mandates. You're talking about overreach of government. So it's not as simple as I'm against masks. In fact, I'm not. And I'm not yeah. against vaccines too. Um, I, I'm a healthcare professional, Mary, so I'm yes, actually for yes. all of those. Absolutely. But I think overreaching the government uh, overhaul is what bothers me to the core. I agree with you. And I'm with you. I, I certainly, uh, I wear a mask still where I go because I have a 72-year-old mom that I am a caregiver for. So I have to look after her and certainly care about your mom and other grandmas and, and other folks. So in the context of protection, uh, I'm vaccinated. So I, you know, it was part of my process as an entertainer, a lot of places where I was being asked to work. I had to be vaccinated and I didn't have a problem doing that. So, you know, I think to each his own, you have to have your own experience, your own conversation with yourself uh, on what is best for you and your family in, in this regard. And, and uh, but I, I don't believe that that government should be making all those choices. I think Americans and I think people in general are smart folks. I think we care about each other and I think we should be given the opportunity to make those decisions for ourselves. Excellent. I think we are on the same page. And I think majority of America is on the same page Absolutely. at this point. Especially, I'm sure you you know that Glenn Youngkin is our gardener right now. And yes! we, exactly. We, we probably, I mean, between you and me now, there is a whole lot of audience that are hearing. There was part of me that just didn't, couldn't be confident that would happen just because uh, we've not had a Republican governor in so long, but I think just kind of uh, sticking to core points like parental involvement and parental empowerment, education, supporting the moms. I mean, the basic things, the kitchen table issues is what made us uh, get where we are right now. Yes, and, I, and it's wonderful. Congratulations to you because I know you were very active in the campaign and, and electing uh, Governor Glenn Youngkin and our, and our First Lady, uh, Suzanne. They're such beautiful people, beautiful family, and it's an exciting time for the state of Virginia uh, to have them in office. And certainly, I'm looking forward to seeing all he's doing, all he's going to do for Virginia, and certainly for America. He's become Absolutely. a part of the national conversation for sure. So, so Mary, if you have not met my my hero, Miss uh, Vincent Sears. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait. And I hope that I will, will meet her soon and I'll be spending some more time in Virginia. She is such a, she's a, she's a hero for us all. She's such a, she's now certainly a part of history, not only for the state of Virginia, but for a part of American history. And uh, it was just so exciting to, to see her and certainly her husband and family uh, during the inauguration uh, there for uh, the new leadership. And, 
and I'm just so very happy for her. I'm, I'm happy for all the young girls who get to sit and watch her trajectory. And she uh, not only is, is a, a part of history, but she has served our country so honorably. And so I, I, I congratulate our Lieutenant Governor. So looking forward to meeting her and, and uh, you make the introduction, I'll, I'll, I'll be there. <laughs> we'll do that, we'll make that happen for you. It's, yeah. uh, Totally yeah, yeah. worth your time, I can tell you. Absolutely. So, um, Mary, getting back to what I was trying to also ask you is less government and more freedom is the way to go. We all know that at this point. And in fact, this morning I was sp speaking to my husband. I say, as an Indian American, the reason India is flourishing in the past 20, 25 years is because government has uh, not gotten our way. And it is a private citizens, it's the competitiveness, it's a meritocracy that's making India flourish. But it wasn't the case when I was living back there. So it pains me to see this unprecedented raise in crime a, a, across America, right? Um, uh, I mean, this isn't about our political affiliation whatsoever. Uh, this isn't about law enforcement versus uh, communities of color, none of that. But what do we do to install, uh, instill in our American hearts that what affects one affects all? And we must rem remember to serve one, you must serve the other as well. So how do we um, kind of correlate and say law enforcement is necessary in order to ensure that this country is, uh, uh, has law and order? How do we ensure, because you have tra traveled globally, I'm sure you have seen uh, what it would be like not to have strong law enforcement. So what, what are your comments on that? Well, I tell you, it's uh, this is also a universal conversation. You know, I, as you know, I am very pro law enforcement, police officers. You know, certainly first responders and those who are in the position, border security and position of protection. I can speak personally. There's no way I could do my job if I didn't have security and law enforcement everywhere I go, and certainly every everywhere I perform and and and, and in my travels, and 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 that's like all people who have a public platform. So some of these folks who have private public platforms who have gotten out and been uh, against our law enforcement, uh, they are certainly having to retract those comments because it affects your personal life. But from a, a larger conversation, you know, I tell you, you're seeing these movements of, against law enforcement happening across the world. It's not just here in America. And because I, there's, a wrong, there's a wrong perception and definition of law enforcement that unfortunately has been birthed out of very difficult periods uh, we, that we've witnessed here in America with the, the interactions and interfaces of law enforcement and communities of color. But I think it's, it's so important now more than ever, Shalika, that our platforms are not supporting movements about defunding police or defunding law enforcement. We need law enforcement. Law and order is, is the solution to a healthy uh, and sustainable society and democracy. That's just the truth. Again, if we're going back to movements of truth and movements of freedom, I think we have to recognize the truths. Uh, during our times. And so uh, I have law enforcement in my family. My uncle, in fact, is, is uh, uh, in leadership in law enforcement in Colorado and have cousins and folks who are. So we are a big pro law enforcement family and will always be. And I encourage everyone watching that, you know, I know it's a tough conversation with many families, certainly as an African-American and in the African-American community, there have been difficult interfaces um, with law enforcement, but I, I hope that we don't uh, allow those difficult moments and, and, and sometimes that have been in a fatal situation to stop our energy towards finding commonality and unifying. We need law enforcement and law enforcement needs conversations with our communities so that we can improve our communities and make it a better and safer place uh, for us all you know, across the world. So uh, I, will never, I will never stand on a platform and sing and I will never stand on a platform and support any kind of movement that is against our law enforcement or police officers. We need I think Mary, you, you said something very, very good to me where you said even law enforcement needs to understand the communities of color. Absolutely, absolutely. It's a I always say the relationship should be mutual. It should never be one way around. I respect law enforcement, especially um, living, you know, living in India, I lived in India. Yeah. In 1980s, the way the law enforcement was brutal, um, yeah. I, I respect, but also I think that in order for the conversation to be productive and fruitful, it has to go both ways. They have to reach out to yes. minority communities, immigrant communities as well. And you're starting to see more of, of uh, you know, of course, I, I'm biased to New York because um, I have a home there and lived there a long time. And, and the New York uh, Police Department certainly is a model for a lot of law enforcement across America. But you're starting to see more and more law enforcement 
communities making extra efforts, putting money towards uh, you know, programs and things. And so I, I applaud the law enforcement community as well across the country that's doing their bit to try to help and, and, uh, and, and, and build better relationships with communities of color. Yeah. yeah. So Mary, while we are on the topic of these sensitive topics is what I call, I <laughs> also think we are all children of a colorblind God, right? God has no right. color. Right. America, as you and I agree, and I think uh, most of the country, if not all agree that America is the greatest country in the world. And our kids need to be taught the truth, the bad, the good, the ugly. So what do you think of this critical race theory that's going on in education? I'm not sure how much in tune you are, but I was curious to know what the rhetoric is in uh, media world and from your side let me let me make sure i don't do too many facial expressions with you because it, i tell you this this critical race theory it is first let me say god bless every parent in america right now i pray for you shalika and your husband i pray for all the parents i spoke with so many moms and so many parents uh uh here at cpac here this past weekend and i tell you it, it's a really difficult time for parents in the education system because critical race theory and anything associated, I, I will flat out say it is dangerous for America. It's dangerous for any community uh, the, the, because the way in which it's being uh, discussed or framed, branded, uh, is certainly not what it is. It's, it's a program, it's a, it's a, a movement that is wanting to to uh, teach our kids uh, prejudice, uh, to teach our kids to not love the country that they uh, have been birthed in. It's a, it's a, it's a, an ideology that's uh, um, trying to rewrite history. Uh, it's dangerous. I mean, just flat out. And, and, and I'm unashamed about saying it. And I, I applaud all of these moms, moms for liberty and moms across America and all of these organizations that are empowering moms and dads and parents to be vocal and stand up at school board meetings, run for school board positions uh, and, and get involved because at the end of the day, um, you know, we, we certainly are grateful for educators, absolutely grateful for teachers, grateful for education systems. But at the end of the day, it's parents who have, uh, who have the choice and certainly who have the authority to govern how their children are taught, the values, the educational principles, all inclusive. And, uh, and that's why I applaud Glenn Youngkin because he stepped up to the plate in that election when that was being discussed and certainly being threatened. And he, he, he showed great leadership in, in defending parents and moms. It's why, it's why he won. It's why he and Suzanne, no question, won. Uh, and why governors and other elected officials that are certainly now in their election seasons this year uh, will win because it's a national conversation and it's certainly at the root of um, the shaping of where we are as a country. And so I implore every mom and every dad, don't give up. I know it's tough because you're getting hit all over the country, you know, with these school board meetings and, and media and a lot of things, but keep fighting for freedom. Don't give up. Keep fighting for, for the voice. And for so your Mary, you're such an eloquent speaker. I'm wondering what is stopping you from running? Yeah, I, <laughs> I tell you, I get asked that a lot, to be honest. And I, I, I am grateful to, to be in the assignment as my, as, as, uh, Certainly, uh, my a good friend, a good pastor friend, who's a pastor in Virginia, in Lynchburg, Virginia, says, "Stick to your assignment." And so, my assignment right now is to is to take music and use it as a vehicle to unify and bring all of us together. Uh, but you know, Shalika, I tell you. God is full of surprises. And so I, I won't, uh, I would never say no. If God is calling me to, to get into public office and run, well, I, I'd be happy to serve my country. I'd be happy to serve the state of Virginia because that's where I would run. <laughs> If I, if I work you. Hey, as soon as you get in here, we'll start getting you involved in school board. Yeah, 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 so, so Mary, yeah, I mean, you shouldn't uh, look at me as a stalker by any means. This was one of your old video that tells me how much I follow you. In one of the video, you said you wanted to run for president and I hope that happens. Uh, well, uh, I'm not I, sure if you remember that video at all, but you did. I, I, well, you know, I'm a dreamer. So, you know, from a young age, I, I had big dreams and big goals and I still am a dreamer and uh, you know I, I've been fortunate to have had such longevity in American politics. I love, I love the policy making process and, and what it, the good that it can do for our country and certainly for the world. And so, you know, if, again, if, if God gives me an assignment at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, then I would take it with, with courage and certainly needing his help 
uh, to to um, to represent um, uh, our country. If there's anything we both know, Sharika, we need bold leadership in the White House, and we certainly uh, need it for the times that we're living in. What we're seeing happening in Ukraine and between Ukraine and Russia, and, and let me just say, I'm praying for all of the families, uh, all of the families in Ukraine right now. Uh, what a horrific situation that is. But we need bold leadership in Washington D.C. Certainly. Uh, to uh, uh, be, be strength across the world. The American brand is defined by strength. And while it may be, that may be in question today, uh, make no mistake that the American brand is rooted in courage, it's rooted in strength. And that's what we need today are leaders who have, uh, who have that. So uh, Mary, we'll I'm so glad that other politicians would listen to you, that that is America's brand. And we can't do anything to uh, uh, kind of bring that brand down or kind of, um, I mean, that is our brand and we need to do whatever we can to keep up with our brand. That's right. uh, so Mary, it's kind of obvious. Faith is obviously an integral part of your life. I think anybody that speaks to you for five minutes knows that you are a God child. Uh, uh, you're <laughs> talented. Uh, in, uh, in our Hindu scriptures, they say that anybody that has musical talent is God's child. Uh, <laughs> not that not everyone is, but uh, in, it is said in Hindu scriptures that they're born directly from the God's mouth <laughs> because God's lo God loves them a little more. <laughs> <laughs> Because well, we get in a lot of trouble. So, you know, we have to have a little bit more grace. <laughs> as a, so as a Hindu American myself, uh, Mary, uh, that's my identity. Um, why are leaders within this nation? I don't shy away from talking about faith and God, not because I'm a Hindu American, but just as an American, I don't shy away from talking about my faith as a Hindu American and God. So, but it, 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 this is, people are shying away talking about um, God, even in schools, government entities, college campuses. What is it that, what is there to be shy in a way? If you don't believe in God, that's fine too. But what is it that, um, why do you think our nation is shying away from talking about faith? Yeah. Well, you know, uh, uh, as, a, as a Christian, first, let me just say how much I have loved learning more about the Hindu faith, certainly. Well, I know we're going to get to the conversation about India, so I won't jump the gun, but I, I have loved uh, learning so much about the Hindu faith and my interactions and love of India and, and relationship there. And I think it's wonderful, Shalika, that you are vocal in your faith. Uh, you know, uh, the chief minister of uh, Uttar Pradesh, uh, who I have come to really love and like, uh, said a great statement here recently, because of course they're in their election season in India. And he spoke about how uh, Hinduism certainly uh, is not just a, uh, it's just not, something that we do. It's, it's our cultural identity. It's who we are. And that is what faith is. It's, it is, uh, it is, it is the fiber, the cells, the, the DNA of who we are. And, and I feel that there certainly is a war happening on faith in general, not just Christianity or not just Hinduism, but there's a war happening on faith in general to keep it separate from our national dialogue, to keep it, to keep it quiet across the world. And that's impossible. It's impossible because it's not just America, but you can go anywhere in the world. And, and just like patriotism is a part of who we are, faith is a part of who we are. And so I, I would only challenge viewers watching that, you know, uh, in the times that we're living and certainly the, the challenge that we're facing with people trying to supp supp suppress faith, um, you keep your faith alive uh, and, and be vocal about who you are as a person of faith, those values and principles that make you who you are and that are part of the shaping, the fabric of who we are as, as Americans and as global citizens. Um, we, need, we need people of faith and leadership right now. Again, it's why I'm so grateful that Glenn Youngkin and Suzanne Youngkin are uh, our governor and first lady in Virginia because they are unashamed about Jesus Christ and they're unashamed about their faith. I'm so grateful that we have great leaders like in India with Prime Minister Modi uh, and the chief minister there in Uttar, Uttar Pradesh that are vocal about uh, Hinduism and about faith embedded in who they are as leaders. And so don't, don't lose your faith. Be vocal about your faith in everything that you do. Um, uh, I want to say that to the audience again. Oh, yeah. That, that's extremely inspirational. And I think more young, I hope more young children would listen to this because they're not taught this in school at all. Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah. I hope you will consider going in as a guest lecturer to one of these uh, schools and start talking about. Uh, I'd be happy to know. I'd be happy yeah. to know. It, it, I, it is so important. And I'm so thank you for bringing this conversation into our, our, our space today because it's growing more and more where uh, these energies of separation of church and state and separation of, of faith in general. And it's faith is rooted in the fabric of our, our founding documents in America. And in, in most, if not all countries, faith is rooted in the founding documents and the founding ideals of the start of, 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 um, of countries and governments. And so it's something that you can't separate. It's who we are, it's part of our identity. Absolutely. So Mary, uh, let's talk about civil rights moments. I know during that time, leaders and advocates all over the world assembled to peacefully and strategically fight for equal rights in America. I mean, people from different walks of life, race, religion, backgrounds, they all came together because they all believe that that is the right thing to do. And that was a powerful movement of unity. It was a, not only a movement of unity, but also of love. It was uh, promoted and marched in peace. Um, it was a movement that I felt like was uh, formed and passed legislation leading to equality for African Americans and Asian American stewards to a certain extent, if you go back to um, the 1960s era. That spirit, unity, was missing in BLM, B, uh, Black Lives Matter protest. Uh, all lives matter, Black lives matter, your life matter, my life matter. But <laughs> what, what happened to that spirit and unity? I mean, couldn't they have not done what Martin Luther King Jr. did uh, with just the same spirit, same love, same unity? What changed? Uh, I mean, well, it's been 40 years. I mean, what changed in the country? Well, to be honest, uh, if I can be frank, Shalika, uh, th there is no similarity between the civil rights movement and the Black Lives Matter movement. There are two different philosophies, two different worlds. Uh, you know, I'm pretty vocal about this. I, I've never been a supporter of the Black Lives Matter movement just because I don't know what the movement is for. I don't know what it stands for. It has so many different <laughs> definitions and understandings. I, the great thing about the civil rights movement that it was very clear. It was a movement, like you said, of unity, a movement of peace. It was a movement about infusing the, the fundamentals of equality into the legislative process so that we could all be created. We could all live up to uh, what our founding documents says that we are all created equal. And so Dr. Martin Luther King was a, is a leader, was a leader, and certainly in the context of living out his legacy, that uh, there's no comparison. Uh, you know, he, he had a very clear understanding of his assignment, of his anointing in the Lord, and certainly uh, what he was called to do on earth. And so that was very clear in the energy of the movement and certainly those who marched alongside him. And, you know, I love how Dr. King leaned on not only the scriptures uh, in his in his work leading the civil rights movement but he also leaned on other leaders like like Gandhi and others who were for movements of peace who were for movement nonviolence uh, nonviolent energy in the context of of protesting who were uh, leaders who fostered um, the conversation ideas on bringing other faiths and other cultures and people together because movements of freedom, movements of equality, they affect us all and, it, and it's for, for all of us. And so they're really, to me, there's no comparison between the civil rights movement and BLM. Uh, while BLM certainly, the movement has raised some conversations that are important uh, as it relates to bettering our communities across the world. Uh, the civil rights movement had very strategic uh, victories, one being the 1964 Civil Rights Act, which brought, you know, uh, equality, certainly in, in the context of, of America and certainly across the world, but it also it ushered in the voting right act, it ushered in other kinds of pieces of legislation that have become the fabric of, of freedom uh, in America. And so, uh, you know, I, my only hope is that out, out of this BLM conversation and energy that we can find better ways to unify our communities. Again, I think going back to the law enforcement and communities of color, since that was such a big part of the BLM movement, that we can find better ways for law enforcement and communities to talk more, to build relationship with more. And that's happening, no question, that's happening. And, um, and I hope that the next modern day Martin Luther King will rise up because we need, we need a Dr. King today uh, to live out these truths that all men are created, are created equal. And, and with, these, 
with the rise of these conversations with race, with the rise of these conversations that are unfortunately bringing division across America. We need a Martin Luther King today that will remind us that it's not a conversation of the color of our skin, but the content of our character, the fabric Absolutely. of who we are as people, yeah. Mary, I think that's why you're an inspiration to many of us and uh, to the global world. I think you bring out solutions. I mean, yes, BLM did happen. We can't change that at this point. But I think out of that, we realize that more conversations need to happen. Just like this, more conversations need to happen between communities of color and law enforcement. Absolutely. So that's a solution. I think that's what conservatives and Republicans need to focus on and not focus on writing, but focus on unity and freedom. And how do we bridge the gap between these problems and solutions? Absolutely. So, yeah. yeah. So just like you, Mary, I also believe in global freedom and democracy. Trust right. me, I think um, uh, as, as much as I've traveled, I've not traveled extensively, but I have traveled quite a bit to multiple continents to know that it's yeah. very important that we all support global freedom and democracy. That's why I have my year ground on global elections. So I am always pleasantly surprised when you even can take the word of Uttar Pradesh. Not many people in America would even know what that is. Sure, sure, sure. Reason, it's completely not um, a part of their mainstream discussions. So, but for me though, geopolitics do matter. They matter to the national security of our great land. As you know, America's stance uh, um, is getting weaker in the geopolitical arena by each passing day. I mean, we are just now seeing everything unfold and our hearts break when we see those Ukrainian citizens, regular citizens like you and me, have to just put their children in buses, put their wives and families in buses, not knowing when they're ever going to meet them. So, uh, and I think geopoliticals should matter to the national security for everything. What are your thoughts on what is going on globally and how do we uh, strengthen our position, United States position, because you said, said very well, our brand matters. A lot of people trust America as a brand to protect all of this. So what can, what do you think government should be doing to strengthen our stance or brand on international platforms in these geopolitical arena? It's a great question, Sharika, and thank you for, for bringing this up. You know, first, I, I always say, look, regardless, Republican, Democrat, whatever, for my position and platform, I always want of the leader of our free world to to succeed. Uh, I, I I certainly recognize the challenge. Yeah. Yes, you know we all do. I, I I and I applaud President Trump when he spoke last night. He actually said this himself. Certainly as a as a former president and and. Uh, said this in the context of, of President Biden. We all want President Biden to succeed. We all want the administration to succeed. And, uh, uh, but I think that this administration uh, is facing challenges um, uh, greater than, than we've ever seen, certainly in the context of freedom. And, and so, you know, I, I'll, I'll, I'll say this again, America, our brand is rooted in courage. It's rooted in strength. And it's why we need leaders today in governorships, in local positions, uh, in Congress, why we need leaders who have that as a part of their personal DNA, courage and strength, because it's gonna require us to make unorthodox decisions, new decisions, be innovative in how we're, we're developing policy. It's gonna require um, uh, boldness and courage with the challenges that we're facing across the world. And, and what we're seeing happening, certainly between Russia and Ukraine, uh, some of the challenges that are going on uh, between our interfaces with China um, and, and certainly across the world, it's requiring bold leadership. And so, I, I will repeat again, America is looked to as the beacon of hope, but it's also looked to as the model for stability in the, in the, in the world, democracy across the world. And, and so we have to have leaders in positions now who have an understanding of the world, who have an understanding of geopolitics, who have, uh, have the experience and expertise uh, on navigating uh, so, some of the challenges that we're seeing today and not being afraid uh, to, to stand up for freedom, to stand up for uh, human dignity, to stand up for, for what's right. And again, I, I, I will quote Glenn Bleck uh, from the other night at CPAC where he spoke about these move, this movement of truth. It's a conversation now, not just about Republican, Democrat, policy this, policy that, 
We're living in some days where the conversation is truly about good and evil. And, and we have to have leaders who are not afraid to go there and say, this is a conversation about good and evil, a conversation about what's right and what's wrong and, and make decisions that are not only good for America as an American leader, but make decisions that are best for the world when it comes to good and evil and right and wrong. Absolutely. I think, Mary, you kind of took it through a nice course. If people heard it clearly, I was hearing you even say that uh, that's why it's important that we have these elected leaders in the office that have moral compass and courage and leadership, because we can't change our stance uh, as a bolder leadership in the international platform until we have leaders, not just the president. I mean, I want our president to succeed, uh, sure. regardless of the party affiliation. I'm always, uh, that's one of the things that I seek and pray for God that our country yes. will only succeed if our leaders. But I think electing those leaders, it just boils down to let's elect wise leaders that have this uh, understanding about geopolitics. They understand that having bold uh, leadership is the way to go. You can't just right. be me and make meek decisions or selfish decisions uh, that would affect Americans in the long run. Right, and I, I'm partial. I have no problem saying, Shalika, to your point, great words that you shared. You know, I feel that the times that we're living in, that conservative leadership is the best, uh, best forward uh, way right now. You know, again, I have friends on both sides of the aisle and have interfaces with as much Republicans as I do Democrats. But I just feel that the times that we're living in, uh, the platform and the basis of who we are as a party, I just feel that conservative leadership is the answer to a lot of uh, particular states and areas that are needing bold leadership. And I'll be as bold to say that I just feel that conservative leadership is necessary back in the White House. I really do. I, I, I won't uh, chime in on a particular person per se, because we're a little far out from that. But I will say that I believe that uh, conservative leadership period is needed back in the White House. Um, with oh, all absolutely. respect to our, our thank, chief. And know. thank you for differentiating that as much as we want to support, support whoever is in the White House administration, it's not too selfish for us as American citizens to think that we want conservative leadership there because we know those are the people that can make a difference. Absolutely. So, Mary, while we're talking about global platforms, uh, in 2020, you performed the Indian National Anthem for the 74th anniversary of India's Independence Day and the beloved Hindu Haim, Om Jai Jagadishwar Hare, for the Diwali observance. Uh, um, I mean, that has been viewed by communities in the world, the entire Indian diaspora in the world. I'm curious to know, how did your relationship with India began? And also, I mean, not only I think in um, your entrenched in Indian politics, but you also know other politics, other platforms. But I think, again, I'm selfish. <laughs> I am yes, uh, okay. I am American. So I was curious to know, how did your relationship with India began? And how could you recite Sanskrit, the Hindu Haim, so eloquently? How, how, how is that possible? You're not well, a native speaker. How, how did you do that? Well, let me just say how much I love India and how much I love the Indian American community. And, and uh, India is family to me. Community, Indian communities across the world has become my family. My, my origins with India actually start back during my days in service to President Bush. I had some interfaces when I was working as a White House intern first and then uh, a White House presidential appointee the last four years of President Bush's administration to have some interfaces with the Indian American community. And certainly when we had delegations uh, that came over from India um, and that's where it really started. Uh, I probably, if I were to be honest, it really started back in my home. Uh, we had uh, a lot of uh, friends and family in our church. We had a, a, a pretty uh, active Indian uh, community in Oklahoma and certainly in our church. And uh, my mother's good friend, Smita Patel, who helped uh, in many ways raise us in the home. I learned a lot of traditions, Indian traditions and the culinary and, and movies and so many things started in my home actually as a child that then certainly came back again during my service in Washington, and here we are today. I tell you, those performances were such meaningful moments for me in 2020, uh, not only because they were uh, edifying and, and certainly celebrating a country that I love deeply, but it was, it was bringing into the space this beautiful moment of culture. Uh, and I, I'll never forget those moments and so grateful that those performances have now opened a whole new world for me in the context 
protects a family. And uh, in my preparations, we're planning a trip to go to India uh, here soon. Uh, and I'm so excited because I've been so eager to visit this land that I have become, that has become family and home to me. It's almost reminiscent of, of Dr. King's trip, his pilgrimage in 1959, when he went to visit India the first time. I feel so many ways that that's what this trip is going to be for me. It's, it's uh, as Dr. King would say, uh, he has said on his trip, when I go to other countries, Countries, I may go as a tourist, but when I when I come to India, uh, it's a oh, yes, it's a pilgrimage, and I feel that that's what this trip is going to be for me. It's it's like a coming home almost, or seeing a family that has become so much a part of my life. And um, I have great respect for Prime Minister Modi, uh, great respect for uh, President Kovinda, and certainly uh, the leadership there, and want to do everything that I can to continue to use my platform uh, to promote policies that are uplifting the Indian people, certainly there in India and in the Indian American community, and certainly across the world. Yeah, let me put it this way, you're a blessed soul. <laughs> you're, tr you're truly are blessed. <laughs> So uh, Mary, I, I'm sure you sing in a lot of churches, right? Or you're in touch with a lot of pastors with the work that you do. Why, why is that many Black Christian uh, leaders and pastors have significant differences with Republican leaders? Uh, I mean, first thing, why do they have it? What do we do to change that? Because most of the um, uh, African-American and Black communities, church is their second home. So if there are a lot of preachings that are happening against conservatism, which I don't think it's happening, but they do have significant differences that they're trying to reconcile. How do we change that and let them know that we actually embrace you all? So where, where do we start there? Where do we start? Well, I think a lot of, I, I, you know, having my parents being retired ministers and, and certainly having a lot of interfaces with the African-American church, you know, I, I think that uh, there's a, there's a, you'd be surprised how uh, there are many uh, leading uh, pastors in the African-American community and churches that are, are conservatives. I think there is a fear from a lot of Black pastors and Black pulpits to be truthful about their affiliations because, you know, we're living in a cancer culture and, you know, all this woke and foolishness. But I think there are a lot of pastors that are fearful, just to be honest, about their their close association with conservative values, because I have certainly noticed in my interfaces in the, in the Black church, and that's all shapes and sizes across the country, Many black churches and pastors are very uh, pro-life, pro-Israel, pro-small business and less government. Uh, they really do in, in many ways align with conservative values. And so uh, my, my, uh, my energies uh, as an entertainer and certainly active in, in the black community, the church community, is to encourage black pastors to not be afraid to be vocal um, about their their values and associations that may be on both sides. I think, you know, at the end of the day, pastors have to understand that congregations are uh, just as diverse as our country is. You have Republicans and Democrats and all types of ideology sitting in your audience. And so the more inclusive you are and the more uh, you encourage dialogue around uh, a diversity of issues, the better it is because we all go to church, we all go to temples, we all go to places of worship on a weekly basis. And it's important that our churches are active in the publicity uh, in the public policy dialogue. That's what's most important. Whether you're Republican or Democrat, we need communities of faith across the board involved in the shaping of policy you know, for the country. And Certainly that should be a, a standard across the world. And so uh, I just think black pastors need to uh, not be afraid uh, to be vocal about being conservatives. And I know a lot of them who are afraid <laughs> to be vocal about being conservative or, and, and I wanna embold, I wanna challenge them publicly to, these are the times where we need boldness. This is the, these are the times where we need strength. Dr. King was not afraid to be vocal about uh, his assignment and certainly as it related to developing policy and the, and the shaping of values. And so I, I, I hope that more black 
preachers and churches will become vocal in that regard. Mary, you are such an inspiration. I could bring you every month. Uh, I <laughs> brought you in during, uh, inter uh, during Black History Month, but I would love to bring you again for International Absolutely. Women's Month. I mean, because yeah. you have so much to share and you, uh, you are such an inspiration. I hope more young Black girls uh, get to listen to you. Uh, Mary, as we are getting uh, uh, close to the end of this conversation, so I can't believe an hour passed by like it. Oh, goodness. I'm so sorry. I probably talked too much. No, I'm no, so this is amazing. I'm telling you, I'm going to try to re rewind and replay this over and over again, and also try to utilize the um, a video in some other forums to get the message because you have such great messages. I mean, I'm never going to ask you to spring na uh, sing national anthem by any means, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I would love for you to sing two sentences of anything. I can't let you go without uh, 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 without letting you sing something. Oh, You've been God. blessed to travel across this nation. You perform the America's patriotic music. I feel there is such a deeper meaning when we sing Star Spangled Banner, even at a sporting event or a political function. Function, it doesn't matter. To me personally, Mary, that's a sacred moment, right? Where we really pause, all of us are unified and reflect on this great country and sacrifices that, that people had to make just so somebody like me as an immigrant can have a great life here. So in today's culture, there's a lot of conversations about the national anthem and you have eloquently said it and you have eloquently sang, but I want you to uh, sing like two sentences of something that I think uh, people would enjoy listening. Oh, if it's not too much to ask. No, well, I tell you, it's so funny because we, a lot of times people, you know, they just expect entertainers to be able to jump up. I said, you know, I have a lot of nerves. When I'm on stage, it's like a, you're like a totally different person. You can you get in the zone and do it. I said, but when you're like spontaneously asked to like sing karaoke or jump on, I said, I get really nervous. I don't know what to do. <laughs> but uh, um, let me think. I think probably a song that's most appropriate since we've had such beautiful dialogue about faith and such beautiful dialogue about love of country uh, would be a song that we both know. Maybe you can join in and sing with me if you will. And and, and we all know this song. In fact, if you're watching from home, sing it with me. And that is the beautiful uh, thread of our country, which is God bless America, land that I love, stand beside her and guide her through the night with a light from above from the mountains to the prairies to the oceans wide with fall god bless america my home sweet home god bless america my home, sweet home. And forgive me because I've been singing all, all week and singing at CPAC, so I'm a little hoarse tonight. Yeah, but yeah. This was, you, you literally brought tears to my eyes. I didn't want to start chiming in and spoil it for you. No, you're supposed to join me, Shalika. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was the moment that was great mary i can't thank you i know you're a very busy lady you were at cpac for the past few days performing there i mean you're an entertainer you're in media you are a very eloquent political speaker i am thankful that you agreed to come on conversations that count oh, i'm very thankful for fafa it's gop for willing to uh, invite you they as soon as i proposed your name they're like sure great yeah. i'm honored that you spend the time with me and our viewers I am going to send this link to Vincent Sears, have it asking her Please. to listen to you. I think she will be equally impressed as much as we are all impressed with Vincent Sears. The, I, I mean, continue your best. spirit. I mean, well, all I can say is continue your spirit within this nation and also internationally. We need cultural positive ambassadors like you advocating for America in uh, internationally as well. Uh, the time is now. I mean, um, I mean, do you have any parting words for us to say? 
Well, I tell you, first, let me thank you, Sharlika. You're such a beautiful woman, such a beautiful woman of faith and such a wonderful leader in Virginia and in our country. So thank you for all that you are doing uh, here in the state of Virginia and in America. And you have my full support. Anytime you need anything, you know to, to call on me, I'm there. And, and uh, certainly thank you to the Fairfax, Fairfax County GOP, to the Republican Party in Virginia. Uh, God bless our great governor, Glenn Youngkin, and First Lady Suzanne Youngkin, our Lieutenant Governor Wilson, uh, uh, Lieutenant Governor Sears and her husband and family and all the leadership there in Virginia. And, uh, you know, I say as some parting words today, you know, we all are called by God to do something great on this earth. There is a purpose for all of our lives. And no matter what it is, I, I encourage all watching to do it with full force full force with full energy. You know, our times are calling again, like we talked about boldness, strength, leadership, and we all have a part to make our country and our world a better place. And so I wanna encourage everyone watching, follow the voice of God, do exactly what God has, is calling you to do. There's an assignment, a purpose for your life. And, and it's great. If you're still breathing tonight, that means you have a purpose by God to be on this earth and to do something great in the world. And so I wanna encourage everyone, follow the voice of God, fulfill your assignment on this earth and let's make the world a better place for everyone. Thank you, Mary. Thank you so much. That was such a, a nice concluding remarks. So viewers, you have uh, seen Mary Melvin, you've kind of heard her for the past, uh, um, uh, past hour or so, and uh, Mary will be in Virginia soon. So hopefully uh, Mary will consider being part of um, not only Fairfax GOP, but also the public party, party of Virginia and actually run sometimes. would love to see Mary being the president uh, of this great nation. Um, so viewers, we, as next March is an international women's month. So we are going to be bringing in several women leaders across the country on our platform. I okay. hope you continue to uh, support conversations that count, log in on Fridays, Saturdays, or Sundays, one of those days, I will definitely have a speaker or a person that we interview and get their insights. Thank you for supporting Mary. Thank you for supporting conversations that count in Fairfax GOP. And uh, God bless you all. And God bless America. Thank you. God bless you. And God bless our troops. God bless you all. God bless.